friends sidhi bangar here so welcome to part 2 of india china relationships but before that let's have a brief introduction about me i'm sidhi bangar i have 3 years of cumulative teaching experience i graduated from bit mesra in uh, 2011 then appeared for civil services for mains and an interview qualified cat sat and all other mba exams and did my mba in hr from xlr i jamshedpur with that folks uh, i'll briefly tell you about an academy platform so we have daily live classes here also please let me know if i'm not audible enough i have a sore throat so if you find difficulty in uh, hearing me out please let me know we have daily live classes uh, a lot of people have already attended my an academy live classes on science and technology it was a complete course for both prelims and mains wherein i covered entire gs3 uh syllabus for science and technology between may 19 to may 2020 so that you are well prepared for upsc 2020 we also provide you with live test and quizzes and pdf of the notes that we used to teach in the live classes we also provide you with structured courses that means all the courses are structured with the syllabus of the upsc as what i did with my science and technology course the first lecture for the science and technology course is free so you can go and check out my pedagogy and also look at the course structure that i have followed with that we also provide you with unlimited access so that with one subscription of an academy that you take to watch my course you get access to greater than 200 courses that we have on our platform that includes all the live and upcoming courses also and you can of course watch all the recorded lectures a lot of my students actually end up watching the recorded lectures if they have classes which clash with some other times so you can always watch that and take the notes from there with that we have the top educators teaching on our platform and i won't be modest including me and let's go on that we actually co- cover up all the courses that are a part of your prelims as well as mains exam right till the interview we prepare you for every stage of civil services at a very very reasonable price for one year the cost comes out to be less than 40000 if you use my code sbus and for two years the cost comes out to be again less than 30000 per year if you use my code sbus which makes the two year subscription cost just rupees less than under rupees 58000 and of course we have a no cost emi available on 6 month 12 month and 24 month subscription so that you do not need to do the entire down payment in one go with that let's start with india ir series part 2 india china relations part 2 now today our flow will be what china wants you know before whenever you want to write any answer which is related to international relationships right in that case you have to first understand what the other country wants good morning everyone glad to see everyone of you here so before you proceed to forge a diplomatic initiative or any action against any country you really need to understand what they are looking for what is their strategy what are the national interests they are trying to secure on a foreign stage right so first we'll discuss what china wants then we will discuss the various diplomatic and other engagements of india and china here i would like to mention that in the previous class that is india china relations part 2 i had already mentioned it to a lot of my students who are there on my telegram channel that please watch the india china relations part 1 to actually understand this better because i've covered a lot of agreement and disagreement over india and china in my previous lecture here i will be taking it forward on other multilateral forums that what are the crux of the issues that you keep hearing about in the news articles so it's more about the here and the now the uh, the lecture that we covered yesterday was more about the history of india china relationships and why have the skirmishes been occurring between india and china after understanding both these things that what china wants and what is that what is india indo china engagement at various levels we will 
try to determine a way forward on india china diplomacy now this is the most important part of the lecture so be very alert when i am talking about the way forward path because that is what is actually concerned with your mains examination so upsc knows about the problem that is going on between india china everybody knows that so where is the difference where can you create your difference in writing your answers when you have a clear thought out path in your head on how to go forward with india china because that is what will be your job as a diplomat all right and further we'll talk about india nepal relations in our coming lectures the updates or the details of that i will share on the telegram group or channel wherever you feel like you can join up also uh, for this lecture please keep your pen and paper in hand most of the topics that i'll be covering will be from the ppt that i'm sharing right now but some of the topics especially the way forward or india china diplomacy i'll be speaking out so i want you to take notes of that all right let's begin so brief a uh, quick review of what we studied yesterday we studied about the relative strengths of india and china and how they come together if they come together how they become a very very big power in the asia in fact how they can actually form a asian century so they have a 10th of global gdp fifth of world exports that is 20% of the world exports largest combined population in the world and sixth of all international capital flows in 3 trillion dollar in foreign currency exchange reserves going further this comparative analysis i am not going all over again but i want you to remember this point about china's foreign policy because this will drive our diplomatic relations with china how does this policy of china harmony without uniformity actually leads on to the kind of actions that china has been taken on the foreign stage or with india and i would also want you to remember a couple of things from the timeline of indo china relationships that is one is the road that was built between the jinjiang uyghur autonomous region with pakistan right the road the economic corridor that is between china and pakistan which goes through pak occupied kashmir and india is wary of that and the support of china to pakistan in each and every war that we have had with pakistan so the china pakistan axis is clearly visible and we will see how it is also visible at international fora and how it is actually blocking india's prospects at a lot of uh, initiatives or at a lot of multilateral forum uh sorry all right so i will take the queries at the end of the session all right okay now let's move on further the other thing that i want you to remember today is uh one more there is a correction in the previous slides i have mentioned chushal here it's not chushal it is chumar region where we had this standoff in 2014 all right and then our today's diplomacy or way forward with the diplomacy will actually depend upon the galwan face off because this thing this this in this face off that has recently happened which led to the loss of 20 uh, indian lives or lives of our indian soldiers it has actually changed the way india now sees india china relationships and we actually think it is about time that we do something about it also please keep in mind this point that china was granted the observer status in sark 2005 we will be discussing it further now let us begin our today's topic of what china wants but before understanding what china wants the first thing we need to understand how china actually look looks at the world so if you see this picture this picture is very clean for china this is all china is it can clearly see till tiananmen square where those famous protests took uh, place after the cultural revolution and after the economic reforms other than that all it sees is pacific ocean and america it does not see anything in between for it africa is very far off and europe is only known for prada and the memes it does not uh, concern china in any other way india does not even feature on its list all right with that and they also see a chinese flag on taiwan here 
without it actually indicates that all it sees is that taiwan is a part of china and it has certain interest in the pacific ocean and it has to overcome the american economy or establish it, establish its hegemony that's all what china sees now let's go by point wise so at present india act, sorry china does not trust the existing international system the existing international system is led by the us us actually defines the rules of engagement and china feels that us is actually a threat to world peace and stability why because it feels that us is a uh, maximum strain on or in transition on human rights or democracy or its imperative to impose its values and ideals on the other nation does not harbor well for china in fact it feels that us often wants to delegitimize the chinese communist government and that is where the policy of harmony without uniformity comes in china has time and again told us that look uh, we might be very different in the way our political systems run but that shouldn't be a problem in which our economy is run in fact we should keep our economy and our other issues separately that has been the uh, most often spoken line of diplomacy by china towards the us now it also feels that the world does not give enough importance to asia and china in particular the world does not actually take into account chinese opinion very prominently and it has a major problem with that we will i will tell you why because china was a very well known economy just like india in the ancient times it was it was a dragon then it is a dragon then and in between it actually lost its charm china is trying to gain that dragon charm again it wants the world to take notice likewise it used to be there in the past china was known for its exports china was known a country which produced very high quality goods it was the manufacturing capital of the world then just second to india so it wants to regain that status that's how china wants the new international system to evolve so let's move on to how it actually wants to change the international system now so the previous slide was about how it actually saw the present international system this slide is about how it actually wants to change the present international system to suit it to suit its own requirements so back in october 2017 a statement came from xi jinping the current uh, president of china he said china has stood up to become rich and become strong and that right now it's a leading light for other developing countries and it offers a lot of chinese wisdom and approach to solve a lot of teething problems that face mankind that means china wants to become the world guru for all the other developing nations it wants the nations around it to follow its lead and to develop in a way china has actually developed itself also he said that by 2049 that is 100 years since the people's republic of china will actually uh, uh the will actually be the 100th anniversary of people's republic of china which was formed in 1949 china would end up becoming the global leader in terms of composite national strength all right in terms of composite national strength and international influence that means china will grow itself not only domestically in terms of scientific prowess and economic prowess but also hold a significant international clout and try to build a stable international order which focuses or which is a china centric system which completely aligns with the need of the chinese now let's actually deconstruct it so what is the official chinese stance on how china wants the global international order to evolve with that china says in the future as it just mentioned the 2049 deadline it will become more prominent in its role in stabilizing force regionally and globally china feels that us keeps destabilizing the entire world and you can see it very clearly also there china is not wrong you attack afghanistan then you attack syria you attack iraq you attack libya you have created a havoc all around the world 
just trying to impose your values and ideals and that too fake ones because all you wanted was oil diplomacy all you wanted was to exploit the resources for your own benefit so china feels that it has been acting as a usa has been acting as a destabilizing force lately which has been hampering the economic growth and development of all the developing nations including china so china feels that when it becomes or when it comes to the global center stage it will actually start as of a stabilizing force because it will not the us hegemony will not be there anymore and the way china works there'll be more stability because china does not believe in imposing its own ideals it does not want everybody to become communist all it wants is that people should have trade aligned with chinese interests so i'll tell you this actually aligns with what china has been doing up till now the original chinese statement has always been that we want to develop peacefully and nothing else we are really not interested what goes on around in the rest of the world all we are interested is in our own economic prospect prosperity the prosperity of our nation if we get involved too much in the outside affairs we will actually end up losing our own growth momentum that has been the official chinese stance up till now and it still stays china is least concerned about what goes on in the rest of the world in fact when you look at the news items that keep coming on a daily basis you will see that china reacts very less on the international issues going on and india has an opinion on everything that goes around or comes around because china is mostly concerned about its interest of securing the resources and making itself the global powerhouse it feels that its action should speak louder than its word because once it becomes the global powerhouse it will automatically have the economic clout to influence world decisions and that is what is the part of the rest of the points that i'm going to speak about right now china says it offers a huge market for the world economy and is also one of the most attractive investment destinations which is again true because china is the manufacturing capital of the world china also says that modernization is not equal to westernization china is very very conservative on its value systems and that's why it gave gives out the foreign philosophy of harmony without uniformity it says that we should take up the technology that is offered by the western world but we should not lose our cultural values to do it i mean it's actually kind of against the whole idea of american dream you know when we actually imported american philosophy of liberty equality development the way the foreign nations have developed india also got influenced culturally by the american or the european dream our families have started to align with that our culture our food practices have started to align with that of the american culture in fact it's often called the mcdonaldize uh, mcdonaldization of the india entire indian culture china says that we don't want it to influence our culture we simply want to take their good parts the technology but not their culture we want to retain the crux of our values the next point china makes is that china has a right to pursue its economic domestic foreign interest for the benefit of its own people and it wants the world to recognize that it will do anything to do it and it also wants the world to recognize that it will not let anybody to damage its sovereignty or its core interest all right and additionally that whatever it is doing for the benefit of its own people is very very legitimate china does not find anything illegitimate in its belligerent approach towards its neighbors or towards the rest of the world when it is trying to secure its national interest now these two points will actually form the backbone of our diplomacy with china going forward why because up till now starting from nehru till modi we have believed in building personal relationships with chinese leaders and believing the fact that china actually believes in the international world order in international bond homie in international peace and international rules of engagement which is actually not true all china believes in it is that it has to secure its national interest and its national interest stand above any international's interest that might come in its path the morality the responsibility towards international relationships 
is something it does not account for. All it accounts for is better life for its people and to do that it will go to any extent. And India in a similar vein has to answer similarly by securing its national interest with China and not believing that it will act otherwise or will take into consideration the international morality or its responsibility as an international nation. Though it is too much to speak for, but this is how it looks like with the recent Galwan standoff and we'll talk about it later in the video. With that, finally, what is the conclusion? What does China want? So this picture has a lot of significance, you know. It is a yuan symbol. China is actually trying controlling the world economy and that's why the world rotates with China being the flag bearer. That is what the China wants. China again wants to become the world's largest economy. It wants the respect it enjoyed in the centuries in the past, but at present it actually does not know how to achieve it or deserve it. And that's why the aggressions we keep seeing that flare up either in the South China Sea along with its eastern neighbors or that keep flaring it with India or Nepal or any other country are because it still really does not know how to use its economic power and balance it with some kind of soft power towards the other nations. You know, it's more like organizational behavior, something that we study in MBA. You cannot work with a superstar jerk. A person might be very intelligent, very efficient. But if that person is a jerk, you would not want to work with that. Instead, we would want to associate ourselves with somebody who is average in working, average in whatever they do, but they are actually a team player. They are more easier to work with. And what China forgets here when it interacts with the other nations is that emotional intelligence or the ability to understand what other nations want is equally important in securing its own international interest as much as to force its economic interest or its international interest down the throat of others forcefully. So what it is not understanding is force is not the only way in which diplomacy works. That's the whole crux of what China wants. With that, let's proceed on various multilateral interactions of India and China at various multilateral fora. Any doubts so far, fellas? If there are any doubts, I will just pause and answer your questions. If there are any which are relevant to the lecture. Okay, if there are any, please let me know. With that, let's start. The first is the ASEAN. Why have I covered it? Because ASEAN is actually considered to be a global powerhouse. It connects the East Asian countries very, very intricately. It's a very old organization found back in 1967. All right. And the member countries, the 10 member countries are Brunei, Darus Salaam, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand and Vietnam. It has also the tiger economy of the East. China is not a part of ASEAN per se, the proper ASEAN, but China is a part of ASEAN plus three. What is ASEAN plus three? ASEAN plus three includes, the plus three includes China, Japan and South Korea. All the growing and very strong economies of Southeast and East Asia, right? That is the ASEAN plus three. It is a form of, this ASEAN plus three is a form of Southeast Asia and East Asia cooperation. Sorry for the spelling mistake. And it started off in 1997, all right? It was around the same time that India started with the BIMSTEC initiative about which I've already discussed in my previous lectures and also the Indian Ocean Rim for Association of Regional Cooperation. Both these initiatives were also started during the 1997 time. They were started during the time of I.K. Gujral. Needless to say, he was a visionary when it came to the Loki East India policy, which was given by Narasimha Rao, his predecessor. Now, 
India is a part of ASEAN plus six. So what happened initially? Let's move on to the East Asia summit part of it. This part of it to understand the relationships with ASEAN in a better manner. ASEAN plus six came as an opposition to ASEAN plus three. You know, the habit of Chinese is that wherever it goes, it starts dominating that grouping and the other people actually get scared of that it is. So, for example, you have a group of friends. Uh, I do not know how many of you have actually watched the Big Bang Theory. If you watch it, if you have watched it and for those who have watched it, you will easily understand it. So, Sheldon tries, Sheldon Cooper is a scientist in there who is very eccentric. He tries to actually grab the attention all of the time by his wit, by his super intelligence. He is a genius. So he tries to dominate each and every conversation which is not liked by his group of friends. A similar thing happens with China. Wherever China goes, it says, I have a lot of money. I am very powerful. I am very intelligent. I am a very ancient country. I know everything about the world and do what I say. And it actually makes everybody else very uncomfortable. Because most of the East Asian countries, I will tell you why. Most of the East Asian countries are very, very self-respecting. Why? Because all of them have a colonial past. Japan does not have a proper colonial past. But it was one that lost the war. And finally had to use US to actually come back as an economic power. So all of these Eastern nations are very, very self-respecting because they are all self-made. So if you go and tell a self-made person that I know better, you know nothing, I have so much economic power, will they feel good about it? Absolutely no. And that was the reason Japan, which is a very self-respecting nation, got India into the ASEAN plus six and they actually started the East Asian summit. The reason to get India into the ASEAN plus six was that India only has a comparative size compared to China and a comparative economic and social cloud compared to China. So that if India is there in the ASEAN plus six dialogue, it will actually be able to balance China and bolster Japanese representation in the ASEAN, right? So ASEAN plus six includes ASEAN plus three. That means China, Japan and South Korea plus India, New Zealand and Australia. So can you see that East Asia summit has actually become an Asia Pacific grouping? Why did New Zealand and Australia started joining it? Here guys, I want you to make notes. Because these, this, the what am I speaking right now is not a part of this PPT. All right. It's a part of analysis that I'm doing for you. So I want you to take notes of it. Now, why did New Zealand and Australia decide to join in? They said that China has been troubling them in the Pacific waters also. Now, Australia is the largest island nation in the world. And it actually kind of dominates the Southern Pacific Ocean. And it has had an unbridled, unbridled dominance in the Southern Pacific Ocean. But with China rising, it actually felt threatened because China started having skirmishes. In fact, very recently, China tried to blackmail Australia into giving it, it certain trade initiatives or giving it certain trade benefits to China, to which Australia did not obviously relent. But... Australia also, just like other countries in the southern China Sea or in the Indian subcontinent, started feeling the heat. And that's why I decided to join the ASEAN plus six to actually have that Pacific, to actually combine with the might of ASEAN to counter China's rise in the Asia Pacific. So can you understand, even in the multilateral forums where China is already a part, people do not feel very secure. And they want other nations to come in to actually counter China's rising power. Now, in ASEAN plus six, Japan brought in India to the ASEAN plus six. And Singapore and Indonesia also aided Japan to get in 
India into the East Asia summit. So India was never earlier a part of ASEAN as I have discussed in my previous lectures that it is only in 1992 ASEAN and uh, India actually started their dialogue and by 1996 only ASEAN and uh, India became permanent dialogue partners or the uh, relationship was upgraded and now India and uh, ASEAN have completed 20 years of strategic partnership in 2012. So starting from 1992 to 2012, they completed 20 years of their uh, strategic partnership with Asia. And now India is integrated in a big manner with East Asia Summit and ASEAN plus six or ASEAN as of now. And we are actually focusing on the Act East policy given all what is happening in our Eastern neighborhood with respect to China. Now, this East Asia Summit actually began in 2005 in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. That was the first East Asia Summit. Why am I associating East Asia Summit with ASEAN Plus 6? Because East Asia Summit is nothing but a forum for ASEAN Plus 6 to come and talk with each another or talk with one another. And as I've mentioned here, East Asia Summit is a linchpin of Asia Pacific's economic, political, security, socio-cultural architecture as well as the global economy. Now here there is an another important development. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or the RCEP which was suggested by the East Asia Summit. However, India chose to opt out of it in 2019. In fact, our foreign minister, our current foreign minister has remarked that a no day, no deal is better than getting into a bad deal and that's why we withdrew from the RECP because at that point of time the other nations were not agreeing to India's import concerns. If India opted for RCEP, it had to open its border to all sort of imports from the other Asian nations and India's agriculture and domestic industry would have been completely destroyed by that. So we decided to move out of it. And it's an important development because it has happened recently. So please keep this in mind for the mains examination. Now, let's talk about BRICS. It's a very, very positive engagement between India and China. So actually allaying, allaying all international concerns regarding the mutual strategic rivalry that is between these two regional powers, they were able to successfully institutionalize mutual cooperation in the BRICS in the form of New Development Bank, which came up on 15th July 2014 in Fortaleza Summit of the BRICS in Brazil. All right. In fact, under the aegis of BRICS, they also undertake a lot of coordinated activities on other non-traditional security areas. For example, climate change, terrorism, sustainable development. These are the other areas where India and China engage. Now, look at, I want to show you geographically what are the ASEAN states, what are the ASEAN plus 3 states and what are the ASEAN plus 6 states. So, blue here indicates ASEAN. This is blue. Sorry. Uh, this whole region, the entire Southeast and East Asia is blue. This is the ASEAN, the 10 states, the 10 ASEAN states. All right, India, Australia, New Zealand form the ASEAN plus 6 because ASEAN plus 3 is denominated by China, Japan and South Korea which is here. So the purple is ASEAN plus 3, the purple plus the teal color or this greenish looking color is ASEAN plus Six. So that's how you understand it on the map. RCEP, the full form of RCEP is Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. I hope it clarifies your doubt. All right. Okay. Now let's move on to the next topic. What are the other four hours that we have? Multilateral interactions. SARC. SARC is by and by a South Asian association and China is a part of Southeast Asia. However, 
China was given an observer status in 2005. Russia has also has an observer status in SAR. But India actually did not like China being an observer here. Obviously, why would you like? It's a very, very close grouping of South Asian nations. And India and Pakistan used to dominate SAR. But with China coming in as the observer state, India is not very comfortable. You will never be comfortable what having your enemy watch over you in your very, very close grouping, which you used to dominate till now. So it is actually a point of skirmish and India does not like it. And it's a very, very old grouping. It's an old grouping since 1985. India was the founding member of SARC. In fact, Indira Gandhi laid the foundation of SARC. If you want to know more about it, go and visit my second, third lecture on influence of the uh, prime ministers on the Indian foreign policy. And that is where I've actually discussed this point. All right. So please go and visit all the previous lectures to understand the coming lectures because it is a series of lectures. So if you miss out on the previous lectures, you, uh, you will miss out on your comprehensive understanding of the coming lectures. So please go and visit all the previous lectures first. Now, Shanghai Corporation Organization, it's a very, very important grouping. You know what, why is it very, very important? So I will take that point first. It's actually an organization led by China itself. It was formed in 2001. Now, why is it important? Because it comprises of 40% of the global population, 20% of the global GDP, and 22% of the world's area. And that is why it is very, very important. Important as an organization, but why is it important from India? That I will discuss a little later. Let me first complete on what the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is all about. So it was formed by China in 2001. Originally, India was actually not a member of it. India and Pakistan both became full members of Shanghai Cooperation Organization. In They became full members of uh, Shanghai Corporation Organization in 2017. Right now, the members of Shanghai Corporation, there are eight members of Shanghai Corporation Organization. India, Kazakhstan, China, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, Russia, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. So, can you see all the stands are here? What are these stands known for? They are all the Central Asian Republics post the disintegration of Soviet Union and they are very very important because they have large resources of natural gas and oil and at present they are all since they are all landlocked countries not much business can be done with them either by India or by China unless you go your way through Afghanistan to reach them or you go your way through Pakistan to reach them. So China has currently taken the Pakistan route to reach the Central Asian Republics and also the Russian route to reach the Central Asian Republics. India has taken the Afghanistan-Iran way to reach the Central Asian Republics, right? In fact, the Jaranj Highway in Iran and Afghanistan is a part of reaching the Central Asian Republics and also the Iran-Pakistan or uh, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline is also there. All right. Now, with that, why is this grouping very important for India? So, can you see India and Pakistan are both in the same grouping, which is led by China. It's very, very strange. Why? India was got into Shanghai Corporation Organization by Russia. As usual, as I told you, China has this favorite trademark of trying to occupy the entire international grouping. It was doing a similar thing with all the Central Asian republics. And Russia felt that it was losing out on its form former Soviet partners on which Russia used to have a lot of influence. So Russia used to have a lot of influence on all these Central Asian republics. But when China came in, China started using its economic power to have more influence on them. Basically, Whenever money comes in, her country big jata hai. Every country sells off itself to China given their economic clout. And a similar thing happened here. So Russia said, I need an ally. 
what do you do if you are losing out with your enemy you go and find out other friends to support you russia said india is my all weather friend india also knows russia is its all weather friend so russia got india inducted into the shanghai corporation organization india also obliged why because china also got its all weather friend pakistan into this organization so it actually became another forum for india and pakistan to engage now india has twin objectives here three objectives rather it's a very very important grouping so if you become a part of it you have access to all the central asian republics which are very very important for business and trade so you get direct access to them you can talk to them directly the second thing is that india can complain about pakistan on this multilateral forum and tell that it is doing a lot of terrorism and we need your help against it and in fact that is one of the reasons where china and india have come together to fight against pa pakistan sponsored terrorism so that's one point we agree on and here china and india are together even on this multilateral forum the third thing is shanghai corporation organization is a very very important economic organization it gives you access to a lot of economic prosperity so china india wanted to be a part of it it's a very important diplomatic and economic organization so it raises india's world standing and that's why india wanted to be a part of it so these are the three reasons why india wanted to be a part of the shanghai corporation organization now these factors are not mentioned here so i want you to take a note of these next comes asia pacific economic corporation all right so actually us and japan again us and japan have both been wary of china so they wanted india to be a member of the asia pacific economic cooperation just like australia and new zealand were wary of china and hence joined the asean plus 6 dialogue however they lobbied for india's membership but it could not fall through and even india was not much interested in it india said we are part of enough multilateral fora to exert our influence so it ended there and g20 comes next now g20 was formed in 1999 it is called g20 because it is a grouping of 19 countries plus the european union which makes it a grouping of 20 entities now this was formed in 1999 and it's a grouping of all the developed and developing countries together now initially india and china did not gain an entry into g20 back in 1999 then how did they gain entry obviously economic reasons when the 2008 crisis came in India and China were the wheels of the international economy and finally the international uh, nations or the other nations gave in to the India and China dominance of the economy during the 2008 crisis they completely agreed that India and China have carried on their economic uh, preparedness in a very well manner they have actually conducted themselves very well economically and it would be an advantage for the other nations to have both india and china as a part of this grouping so here also these two nations actually cooperate a lot with each other india and china cooperate a lot on the g20 forum because here so i'll tell you whenever china is pitched against other developed nations like the eu or us it comes running back to india and says we are together we are developing nations let's get together and it happens similarly at the g20 also india and china come together china has uh, forged ties at the g20 forum with india in fact recently also it was in news china said that please you know instead of giving us entry into 5g technology in your into your country give us the access and let us conduct the 5g trials inside india let us export that technology to you so all that talk was actually done at the g20 forum where these both countries uh actually see eye to eye or cooperate a lot apart from the brics forum where they have obviously come into cooperation with that let's move on to the covert issues of tussle these were the overt issues whatever we discuss is something which is visible in public now what is not visible in public now we keep hearing about nsg membership for india or nuclear suppliers group membership of india all right now you must have heard about it a lot in news since the 2005 nuclear deal between india and china 
sorry between india and the us now before i talk about the nuclear deal or nuclear supply membership for india i would like to talk more about the export control regime there are four primarily export control regimes or technology export control regimes what are those these are nsg nuclear suppliers group which was formed in 1974 it has 48 members presently china is a member of nuclear supplier group and though a one time waiver was given by us to india for the nuclear supply group in 2005 china is blocking india's entry into the nuclear supply group so that is a covert tussle between india and china this is the first export control regime the second is the vasanar arrangement it was formed in 1996 and it has 42 members india joined the vasanar agreement recently in february 18 as the 42nd member or the latest member then we have the australia group again it was the oldest of the uh, technology export control regimes it has 43 members and india was the last member to join in january 18 and then we have the missile technology control regime which was formed in 1987 it has 35 members and india joined in 2016 as the 35th member it will be interesting for you to note or uh, to actually understand and note down please note down these pointers that china is only a member of the nsg right it is not even a member of the remaining three export control technology regimes and yet it continues to press india that india's uh, uh, non signatory nature of the nuclear proliferation treaty makes it ineligible for entry into the nuclear suppliers group even when china has been actually flouting the norms of nuclear non proliferation treaty or the mtcr or missile technology control regime rules as per those rules china should not have supported pakistan to become a nuclear power but it covertly did so just to have a negotiating point against india and now when it has done so it says india is not following the rules and hence it keeps blocking on india's entry into the nsg but now what do we have in favor of us so india being given the entry into these three uh, export control regimes india says it is an enough proof of our peace loving nature of our uh, uh, policy of no first use and of our credentials that we should be given entry into the nuclear suppliers group all right with that why does india actually want to be a part of these uh, export control regimes first if you are part of these export control regimes you get access to missile and nuclear technology the latest technology in both these sectors why is it important because as of now information is the new weapon if you are a knowledge economy you are tend to be you will tend to be a world power if you have to be a world power you will, you have to be on the top of your game when it comes to technology you cannot falter on that the second point is that if it becomes a part of these export control regimes india can become a net exporter of missile and nuclear, nuclear technology and earn a good amount of foreign exchange just like all the big countries which export a lot of weaponry to nations like india and earn a lot of foreign exchange in that so it will be highly beneficial to our economy and finally obviously it's a very very high scoring diplomatic point for india it will raise india's international standing by leaps and bounds and that is why the struggle to get into nsg so you must be wondering that when in india was given a one time waiver by the us in 2005 why or where where has it helped because clearly we did not gain an entry into the nsg so where did it help it helped india in gaining into these three regimes because it was only on the basis of the one time nsg waiver that india was able to build its credibility if us has faith in you the other nations will automatically have faith in you and we got in, entry into all these three arrangements one by one and very quickly in a succession of two years we gained entry into these three groupings which we have been trying back since last two decades or last 20 years so we immediately gained entry into these 
Now let's move back to our previous slide and understand the covert issues of tussle. Now, the coming back to the NSD membership, I have discussed everything that is regarding this. Let's come to the permanent seat for India at the UN. Everybody knows about it that China is a permanent member of the UN Security Council. However, it has been blocking India's seat at the UN Security Council. So let's go a little bit, a bit more into the history. No, no, no. India was not, uh, so NSD was not formed due to India nuclear trail. It was already there. All right. What I mean is, it was not just there for India, it was there for every other nation. They actually formed all these groupings to prevent other developing countries to gain nuclear power. You understand why this whole thing is playing out? Because if every country becomes a nuclear power, of, even if small countries become a nuclear power, the large countries or the countries which already have nuclear power, they think that if any new country gains a nuclear power, it will become a threat to world peace. First and second, the covert reason is that it will pose a challenge to them, which these elite countries do not want. In fact, you can see it currently also that when North Korea has gained this kind of nuclear power or Pakistan has gained this kind of nuclear power, it is actually a threat to world peace. Or in fact, that was primary reasons why US engaged with Iran to shut down its nuclear facility or US decided to engage with Korea to shut down its nuclear facilities in lieu of developmental aid to both these countries. Because we do not know, some countries might be responsible, but we do not know how the countries will be responsible if they gain a deadly weapon as deadly as the nuclear power. And that is why these export uh, control regimes are there. All right. Okay. Now, permanent seat for India. So let's going back into the history. We have the People's Republic of China was actually given a seat by US, by the then President Richard Nixon. Why? China was an ally of the US in World War II and it backed the US completely. Now, at that point of time, China was ruled by Chiang Kai-shek. It was not, so it was actually not People's Republic of China. It was Republic of China and China was run democratically. So it kind of aligned with the US principles. And if you remember, China got its independence only in 1949. And that was actually when the communist power take, took off. So before that, China was a democracy, essentially. A China was aligning to the US structure or US political philosophy. If you remember from yesterday's lecture, I had mentioned that political philosophy is a very, very important component in the way nations interact with each other. And it is also a very important component of China's foreign philosophy, which says harmony without uniformity, right? So keep those points in mind. Now, once the communist power took over in 1949, the Republic of China or the Taiwan, from where Chiang Kai uh, Sheikh was actually ruling, it actually lost its power because Taiwan is a very, very small island nation. So the rest of the country said we cannot give the UN security seat to a tiny island nation rather than giving it to mainland China. And then People's Republic of China was actually recognized as a proper successor to the UN seat or UN permanent seat. Now, what happened to India? India was also offered a seat, it was said, by the USSR. China was offered a seat by the US. India was offered a seat by USSR. But, uh, but our Prime Minister uh, Jawaharlal Nehru actually thought that uh, the USSR offering us a seat was actually to counter the power of China or to actually try to build a disharmony between India and China. And he thought that it was not an in interest of India to actually enrage its immediate neighbor China. So we decided to forego the UN seat. We said it was more important for China to be there because China will obviously have an Asian representation. So we just need an Asian representation there. Maybe we can take the seat somewhere, some other time. And we actually lost out on a very, very important opportunity to take a permanent seat at the UN Security Council. Now, what are we doing presently? Presently, we have a G4 or grouping of four, which includes Germany, Brazil and India and Japan who vouch for a permanent seat at the UN to represent the changing realities of the world 
where all these four nations have grown so much that they have an international clout and they are fit to be the members of the permanent seats of United Nations Security Councils. However, US overtly supports India's entry there, though US has not given us a proper answer regarding U uh, India's entry to the uh, United Nations Security Council. China has outrightly rejected our claims to the United Nations Security Council. In fact, it went on to make a mockery of India saying that, you know, um, do you actually feel that US wants you to be there? US is just playing around with you. At least we at China uh, are honest with you saying that we really don't want you there. So you and China ended up making a mockery of India at the world stage by saying that we don't support India's claim to United Nations Security Council. However, India has been a continuous member of the United Nations Security Council as a non-permanent member for around 16 years now. It is world's third largest economy by purchasing power parity and fifth largest economy by nominal GDP rates. It has the second largest military in the world and it has contributed a lot to UN peacekeeping forces. So by all these measures, India is actually fit to have a permanent seat at the UN. So this you can also write in your mains exam. This is the reason why India thinks it's fit to have a permanent seat at the UN and also it will give Asia more representation at the UN. Now, the last issue or the second last issue of TUSSL is the Belt and Road Initiatives. Please take your notes and please listen to this very, very carefully. Now, the actual crux of this whole issue is Asian siblings keep quibbling. India and China both are Asian siblings and they keep quibbling over each and every issue and Belt and Road Initiative being one of them. Belt and Road Initiative came in 2013, all right? Now, it was announced by Xi Jinping as a major part of his foreign policy when he visited Indonesia and Kazakhstan in 2013. He said it was formally known as One Belt, One Road Initiative or OBOR Initiative. He said that uh, we will be doing infrastructure development and investment in nearly 70 countries and international organizations around the world. It is a dollar forty nine billion project. All right. Now, belt here refers to the land routes, land and rail transportation across these seventy countries and international organizations, also called the Silk Road Economic Belt, along the previous Silk or ancient Silk Trade route that China used to have with the rest of the world. Road here refers to the sea routes. So please keep in mind, belt refers to the land routes or the rail transportation and road refers to the sea route or the 21st century maritime silk route. These are two very, very important components of the uh, belt and road initiative or BRI as it is known. Here we have a doubt. I will just answer it. Well, actually, yeah, there is, uh, as you say, yes, there are claims. Uh, I read the similar article about A.G. Nurani, but actually that claim is not false. We did get an offer. However, India felt that it was a trap and that's why we did not fall into the trap. But we did get an offer. It is confirmed that we did get an offer. The second thing is that uh, we do not know. Will India get a further chance to have a permanent seat at the UN? We will have to watch and wait. Wait and watch, actually. All right, with that, Let's move on to the further in this topic. So, uh, this actually, this Belt and Road Initiative also got incorporated into the Constitution of People's Republic of China in 2017. So, it's very, very important for China. China feels it is a bit to enhance regional connectivity and embrace a brighter future for the entire world. Can you see what China wants is actually coming into picture with the Belt and Road Initiative. It's here for all of you to see. Now, it's actually seen as a plan for Chinese world domination. According to a lot of experts, it's seen as a part of Chinese world domination and China-centric global trading network. As I've told you, China just wants an international system centered as per its needs and fancy, fa uh, uh, fancies. 
and that's why it wants a china centered global trading network in the form of belt and road initiative now the target completion date for bri is 2049 which is the 100th anniversary of people's republic of china now what is india's opposition or what is india's role here so india has an opposition to china pakistan economic corridor which has been there since 2013 it is a large infrastructure project which is an under construction throughout pakistan and what are we constructing there a network of highways and railways to actually interlink all of pakistan which will further be used by china to send it goods from pakistan to the central asian countries or african countries for trade and also to have a closer proximity with india because it's actually easier to attack to india from pakistan because the borders are very porous and it will be very difficult for india to actually even decipher what is happening now this is the china pakistan economic corridor project all the lines that you see here are under development under the part of the china pakistan economic corridor project all these lines are being developed criss crossing the entire pakistan as you can see right this is entirely being developed by china now i will show you the bri please see that the lines in blue are the belt or the road initiative or the rail initiative so you can see starting from china in beijing dalian here we are traversing the entire central asia all right going further to europe by the land routes so china will cover almost half of the globe with its land routes only from the international sea routes as you can see china is covering the entire pacific and indian ocean moving through the suez canal to the mediterranean sea further to europe so it's an entire europe to asia connectivity through the maritime route or the road route maritime is called road here and road is called belt in the bri now what is an important point that i actually want to show you here is look at it very carefully all right here i want to make a mention of what i taught in my yesterday's current affairs class in the evening at an academy i want to again further make a mention of it yes you did see it but it's confirmed that they actually got an offer letter not an offer letter but a informal offer was there it was always there it's not a fluke it was there we were given that offer all right we were given that offer so it was there i am confirmed about that okay now what i want you to know here is india also as you can see china has a lot of base stations in the entire maritime route important one being in djibouti colombo or hambantota in sri lanka and it also has an important uh, coco islands near malaysia somewhere here all right now with respect to that india has also acquired four important foreign bases one is in indonesia here which is called sabang port one is near gwadar which is the chabar port iran here another is near dukm which will actually see that djibouti is controlled or the djibouti air base of china does not create a nuisance and one back down near africa the seychelles island uh, near the seychelles island the assumption islands to keep a track on the mozambique channel all right so we are also doing our bit but not as much as china let's move on to our next strategy the race for regional hegemony now this is actually very very important because this is a major bone of contention between india and china why because china is trying to occupy your entire neighborhood and if it does that then india will lose its regional standing and also its regional relationships both economic cultural social with its neighbors so how does china do it there are a couple of points or couple of ways in which china does it so china has committed in the recent past 10 years china has committed more than dollar 150 billion in the economies of bangladesh maldives myanmar 
Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, all South Asian nations. And now, as of now, China is the largest overseas investor in Maldives, Myanmar, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Also, its investment is highest in the two economies that flank India or that has borders with India. Myanmar in the east and Pakistan in the west. These both countries actually face international isolation due to human rights violations and terrorism respectively. So, human rights violations for Myanmar and terrorism for Pakistan. Now, here is an important point here. What is China actually doing? China is... Okay, I, I'll just answer your question, Amit. I'll answer your question. Let me first complete this, all right? Okay. Now, uh, here, what China actually is doing here is, uh, you have these two countries. So, China actually picks and choose countries' pain points. The pain point for Myanmar is, it has been internationally isolated due to human rights violations. And Pakistan has been isolated due to terrorist activities. So it identified the pain points and said, Koi baat nahi, nothing matters, I will give you it. I will provide you with whatever you need. So these two nations who are already belligerent will come into China's coalition and they will create a problem for India. And it is a common practice which China keeps doing. It actually starts finding pain points of India's neighbor and then starts helping them on the same issues. Now, Bangladesh is the most vibrant economy in India's neighborhood. So it is least dependent on China and that's why Bangladesh is still close to India. So China's playbook is very clear. This is the conclusion of the three previous points that I've made. It first enters as a military supplier. It says I will supply you with weaponry and then cultivates and partners with local entities which are there in that nation and provides modern infrastructure with deferred payments that you can pay whenever you want to because it has a lot of economic he uh, heft. And finally, entrenches itself completely because all those nations are indebted to it economically. So they cannot so, uh, say no to any of the Chinese demands that come forth now. All right. Continuing from here. Amit, to answer your question, I do not as of now clearly know whether that uh, route of the ancient silk route actually goes through the Kra Canal or not because I do not think as per my best knowledge, it actually goes through the Ka Canal or the Isthmus of Kara because it's a very, very recent development. And it's a development actually in place to uh, counter China's very strong presence in the Strait of Malacca. So it is a very, very recent development. So I do not think it is related to the Belt and Road Initiative. That's an answer to your question as per me. But we can actually cross-check it. All right. Now. Chinese infra investment usually in these uh, countries is concentrated in hard infrastructure, power, roads, railways, bridges, ports. So you are actually helping the nation to make itself. And most of the times the contractors who do that are Chinese. They are not local people. So that makes the com country in which all these infrastructure projects are happening completely dependent upon the Chinese, both for capital and for manpower. Now, can you see a very interesting thing here? When the British colonized, they used the manpower, the local manpower and the local capital. China does not do that. When it colonizes, it uses its own capital and its own manpower. Now, this is more bad than or worse than what the British used to do. At least if they used to utilize our, the capital of the native nation or the human capital of the native nation, those people could actually disagree and throw the British out. Here, the gate is completely closed for that native nation to actually do it because it is completely dependent on China now. Going that further, beyond the hard infrastructure, China has also started investing in geoeconomics. That means China has started investing in the financial systems of these countries. So China has taken stakes in the share market of Dhaka and Karachi. That means Bangladesh and Pakistan. And Clearly, China is creating new rules of business engagement with the region, changes which India will find very, very difficult to actually reverse or to finally gain its traction back or to gain its dominance back in the Indian neighborhood. Now, 
what are some of the developments that have come across in the neighborhood of india that have been done by china so in maldives china had invested so much in local infrastructure and tourism that it has become a key player in maldivian politics where india is not getting a chance to intervene in pakistan pakistan has taken so much aid in form of china pakistan economic corridor which is approximately a 49 billion dollar project that uh china is actually disguising its strategic play by the use of economic corridor it may bring in some economic benefits to pakistan in the short run but it will almost cost it its big political price with india in the long run it will never be able to settle its political scores with india it will never be able to resolve its dispute with india politely and peacefully if china continues to manage its presence there bangladesh it actually controls financial infrastructure of bangladesh china has invested in a big way in the stock exchange so bangladesh was not dependent on it so it could not go into the infrastructure part of it so what did it do it started investing in the share market so it's actually shaping bangladesh's stock exchange market and influencing bangladesh sri lanka is completely debt trapped with china china has replaced sri lanka's uh biggest economic partner india india used to be sri lanka's biggest economic partner but now it is china and sri lanka is under a lot of debt from china so it will cost its relations uh, so it will actually start hampering sri lanka's external relations with rest of the countries nepal china is actually helping the nepalis nepali elite to actually rule their country so historically nepal enjoyed close ties with india but now given chinese investment there nepal has tilted towards china myanmar myanmar is still resisting chinese primacy while more most of the asian countries are moving towards china myanmar has identified what is china doing to its country so they are actually trying to move away from chinese influence with that we come to the close of our session now this is the crux of the entire session so pay a lot of attention all the cartoons that i have placed here have a lot of importance in what we are going to discuss next now listen to the story very very carefully and first listen to the story and then make notes all right the galwan face off actually was a violation of a lot of border agreements that india and china have now the first step we could do is to actually revisit the agreements and both sides politically commit that they will not break the protocol of engagement at the border however what we are seeing is a more belligerent china china which is ready to fight at the drop of the hat since 2010 and it is not shy of the world hierarchy or the international order right now it is doing as it pleases because of the economic clout it has right so india is left with two options first china suggesting that we should keep the border issues separate from the rest of the diplomatic measure matters and that india should learn to live with a powerful yet largely unpredictable neighbor now what can we do in that so the two options that we have are okay we agree with china's contention that yes we will keep the border issues separate from the diplomatic matters but we will draw a line on the acceptable engagement at the border before we have engagement on any of the other diplomatic matters right because india re china really wants india to be its trading partner and china really wants to expand its technological footprint in india and that's why it is giving this stance so maybe we can carry it out because even india wants to develop and we cannot be in perpetual disharmony with our large asian neighbor but we really need to draw the lines on acceptable behaviors that china follows with india the second is an important one which we will discuss in greater detail is the containment strategy up till now china has been using a very harsh containment strategy on india as you have seen china is blocking india's entry everywhere and what what is that if it is not containment of the indian power on a global stage and if at this point in time after the galwan face off if we do not contain china now we will never be able to do it because as we can see that china is stubborn and it will keep doing the same thing 
if we do not give it a fitting reply or if we do not use chinese diplomacy or if we do not turn the tables back on china so right now it is the appropriate time to build a coalition of like minded nations on diplomacy towards china and actually try to contain china try to contain its expansionist policies and try to contain its belligerent policies why have i placed this cartoon here so the first cartoon is relevant to our first option it says that this creature the dragon is full of thorns so is it wise to actually go into a diplomacy with india to go into a diplomacy with china that's what india is thinking that's related to our first option the second option of containment is as you can see here elephant symbolize symbolizes uh, india this big brother wearing a, a us hat symbolizes us so india along with the help of us can actually tackle the dragon that's the containment strategy now we'll do the containment strategy a little bit more in detail all right okay uh yeah amit so what is your point uh that i'm not understanding what what are you trying to say about the dead because if you don't write complete sentences i won't be able to understand your question all right okay the conclusion before we reach the conclusion i want you to make certain points regarding the containment strategy it can be your answer for mains so please write down the points as i talk about them the first point about containment strategy is that china has been trying to do this china is doing this for a lot of time till now and right now containing china is not more any more of a choice for us it's the necessity it's the need of the time all right the second thing it will not be easy to contain china because it has both the economy and the military power however india is the only country in the neighborhood of china that can actually counter chinese power because it has a considerable size the land size and again a considerable military power also are it is the second largest military la right after chinese military and also india is economically powerful india is powerful in terms of the military force also however our containment strategy this is the third point our containment strategy will fall or will falter without the us in it because us is the only power globally which is doing well or doing better than china and it still has considerable international clout and though we know that us is actually an on and off like of country but at present if it actually ignores china then it will be at its own peril so india needs to explain to the us that now is the time when you can't actually ignore china anymore and you have to cooperate with india to contain china it's india's duty to convince the us now what is the disadvantage with chinese so there are two disadvantages with chinese and which can actually help india contain china all right the first advantage of uh, disadvantage of china is that its location so it's a very hugely landlocked country on its western border so there are a lot of choke points both in the sea as well as on the land which can be used to contain china's exports and imports or china's trade the second point is that china does not use any practical self uh, interest practical initiatives or moderation in its dealings with its neighbors so it has kind of enraged everyone left right and center which actually glues all the nations against it towards one another so all these nations will come will easily come together to actually counter chinese influence because it has enraged everyone in the entire neighborhood be it the south china sea be it the pacific or be it the western world okay there's a couple of doubts that have come up a uh, kind of yes china is one of the biggest competitors uh at least in the neighborhood yes okay now let's come to the second point the second thing is we have to actually the first thing that india can do towards its containment strategy is first of all as a immediate signal to the chinese we should halt the huawei 5g trials in india we should say we don't want your technology we will take the technology from someone else that will give a very very strong message to india 
it is often said hit the stomach not the back because we will if we do that we will be directly kicking in china stomach it will actually compromise on the livelihood or the trade part of china so if we hit that we might be able to actually contain china in some manner the second is india actually cannot free ride anymore india has to be that country which becomes the regional anchor india has to lead from the front it cannot any more rely on the other neighbors or on us to contain china india has to come to the forefront it has to be the anchor point where all other countries form a coalition around india and try to contain china because the free ride is done now if we don't take the responsibility no one else will take our responsibility and the last and the very important mechanism that i want to discuss with you is the quad mechanism what is the quad mechanism q u a d it's the quadrilateral security dialogue all right it was started in 2007 it's between four nations us japan india and australia so it com- it actually uh involves the entire important countries of asia pacific and also includes us in a big manner now these countries actually get together for a lot of military and naval exercises this actually quad become became defunct after 2007 when australia pulled out australia at that point of time right around 20 uh, 10 years or 15 years ago was not in the favor of joining a grouping which can be seen as china to be going against it so australia withdrew but back in 2017 when australia japan us india all of these countries realized that china is becoming belligerent day by day they started to revive this quad grouping and very recently after the galwan face off india actually ap- approached the quad grouping for more help on its diplomacy towards china it said to these quad nations that we need to come together to actually contain china india won't be able to do it alone but now india is prepared to actually deal with it head on and that's why it was so much in news now this is quad what is quad plus so other countries have also joined us in our quest to contain china here the plus here includes vietnam new zealand and south korea can you see this formation is similar to the asean plus 6 or the east asia summit again the causes are similar and the formation is also similar so can you see china is being actually surrounded by a lot of hostile groupings which do not see chinese belligerent notions towards the rest of the world in a very very healthy manner and might work together to actually contain china now in fact recently there have been some developments where india and australia signed the military logistics agreement all right as per this agreement it was signed i think in 2018 or 2019 it was signed recently very recently as per this agreement they can use each other's naval bases for repair and replenishment of their defense of, or of their naval supplies now india has these agreements this agreement military logistics agreement also with the usa and the japan so it all and singapore so it has these agreements with singapore us and japan all the other three nations that means india is also trying to increase increase its clout in the india indo pacific region to contain china and china is actually keeping an eye on it but it can't do much in fact according to a lot of people the galwan standoff was just to indicate to india that whatever initiatives you are trying to take to contain china with the help of us or other nations is not being taken well by us and we can show you your position any time we want and that why that is why the whole galwan standoff actually came into being it is one of the hypothesis we do not know how true it is but it is one of the hypothesis now what is the final conclusion of the entire lecture what is our way forward the way forward is it is time for some decisive action india now cannot any more given to china's whims and fancies it is time we take a firm stand 
it is time we use our international clout our military and our economic power to our advantage in the best possible manner to contain china also it is imperative that we bring china to the discussion table to settle the lac for now and forever in fact after 75 years of independence we cannot afford to have our boundary disputes unresolved this is a very very important point and it's one point where india is completely responsible for not sorting it out with its neighbors whether india whether china whether nepal whether uh, uh pakistan or bangladesh anywhere we have to really resolve our border disputes i have discussed this in greater detail in my india china border dispute uh, uh video which i have shared earlier with you guys in the previous videos now and finally if china india wants to be the regional hegemon or regional power the most important thing is that you have to look inside if you want respect like china then grow like china both in economic terms and in international clout finally if we look at it diplomatically wise india and china have two ways to go one is to fight at each and every level like they have been doing right now or to actually celebrate the coming century as asian century by collaborating together happily it's for these two nations to decide what they actually want to do and hope better sense prevails and they actually take this route instead of this because it is not benefiting anyone we are just ending up quarreling with each and every other nation that comes in our way with that i will close for today but i will take some doubts if there are any okay as of now there are no doubts so i will finally conclude today's session it was a very very long session and i hope it was very informative for you this is my telegram group link for current affairs you can join me on this group and this is my telegram channel group for current affairs and ir and anything else at both these places i post my upcoming videos all right so that you can never uh, miss out on the videos that i will be upcoming next or i will be teaching in my next sessions also on the group you can directly chat with me if you have any queries finally i know you have liked the video because i have really worked hard to put this all together and i know it was very informative but i hope it really helps you out in your preparation for civil services so please subscribe to our channel let's crack upsc csc in english and if you liked my video please hit the like button and please share it with as many friends as you can so that everyone can benefit from it and use my code sbus to get an instant 10% discount on my science and technology course which is featured on the an academy platform all right it will reduce your cost of one year to less than 40000 and for two years your one year fee will become less than 30000 okay to one of the doubts of whether i teach only ir or i teach other subjects so i think uh, it is pretty obvious when i'm saying that i have taught science and technology on the an academy platform and i'm teaching you ir here and in the evening on the an academy platform at around 8:30 pm daily i teach you the current affairs so i think it's a very very redundant question that you are asking and you should maintain the decorum that is there between a student and a teacher and please refrain from asking such questions in future with that i close for today thank you and have a good day